Okay. We're going live. Second. Okay. I pushed the wrong button. Okay, we're gonna start in a second. Give me one minute. Okay, we're gonna ask everybody if you if you uh, don't want to ask a question, you should mute yourself. And we shouldn't hear you right now. Everybody's muted. But uh, I believe you can unmute yourself. But if you do unmute yourself, you can uh, re-mute yourself. Um, OK, good evening, everybody. Um, again, I must thank uh, Jewish Learning Institute, the JLI for putting together this, uh, this wonderful class, um, which they call Maimonides, the man, the myth, the magnum op opus, his, uh, his, his, his teaching self-understood. And um, it's very, very special in these times to do this. And especially today, because today we started, as we'll soon see in the class, we started the Rambam, we started Maimonides, I think for the 40th cycle to learn either the whole Rambam uh, every year. And uh, the Lubavitch should have asked that we should learn the Rambam. In this class, today we started the first chapter of the 14 books of the Rambam, Yad HaChazaka, uh, the first, the first uh, halacha that he, that he says in this, in this book. And we're going to learn this halacha too. We're going to learn the, the, the last halacha and the first halacha of the Rambam uh, of his unbelievable works of Yad HaChazaka. But let's give first a, a uh, introduction to the Rambam. I'm sure everybody heard of the Rambam. The Rambam, let's give you a look. We also see a video here. It'll give you a background. The Rambam, Maimonides, was uh, born in a it was born 11, 1135 in Cordoba, passed away in 1204 in Cairo. The Rambam, um, the Rambam had his chus. You can go visit his 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 uh, his cave. You can go visit his uh, burial place in Tveria. The Rambam had this merit. If you can read the Hebrew. This is a picture of the front of his caver. It says, Me Moshe ad Moshe, like come to Moshe. From Moshe to Moshe, I mean, from Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, whose name was Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe. To Moshe, who is Moshe ben Maimon, like come to Moshe. Nobody stood up like these two great, great leaders of the Jewish nation, like Moshe Rabbeinu. And like Moshe ben Maimon, and um, and you'll see why. There were many, many great sages, even in his time, and 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 before his times, and after his times. But there's something unique about the Rambam, Maimonides, that is that you only find by Moshe Rabbeinu and the Rambam. And therefore, they honored him by uh, by putting this on his. Caver on his on his on his burial place in Tiberius, which he's buried there today. Um, the Rambam, that's what it says in it in English. From Moses to Moses, nobody stood up like Moses. The Rambam was not only by Eden. We know by Eden for sure. There's so many places that are called the Rambam. There is schools that are called Rambam. There are hospitals that are called Rambam. My mom is medical center in, in, in New York. There is even stamps and bills and 
not only by again not only in in Israel but in other countries that have put the Rambam as a face to uh, to uh, to their stamp or to their building. Now it's interesting that, that there's an argument that this picture of the Rambam, this is a real picture if you really look like this. But um, actually, the Rebbe said we should whatever picture it is we should have this picture of the Rambam, whether we know it's correct or we don't know it's correct. We should have this picture so it gives a person some kind of a real, a real realism when you have a picture of the person, whether he looked exactly like, he's look at the stamp of it on four, he looked one way. The picture that's being used over here is a total different picture, but irrelevant. I don't know if anybody, is the, if, the, if there's official portrait of the Rambam or not. I don't think so. Let's hear this beautiful. In the spring of 1138, Jews in the southern Spanish city of Cordoba were preparing for Passover, the festival of deliverance. But the household of the esteemed rabbinical judge of Cordoba, Rabbi Maimon, was celebrating a delivery of another kind, just one day shy of Passover, the rabbi and his wife welcomed their eldest son, whom they named Moshe, Hebrew for Moses. Little did the rabbi know that he was destined to gain eternal fame through Moshe, for his brilliant child grew into the universally acclaimed scholar known as Moses Maimonides, or Moshe, the son of Maimon. It was a trying time for the Jews of Spain. The Almohads, a fanatical Islamic movement bent on establishing a caliphate, were gradually overrunning the Iberian Peninsula. Countless Jews were murdered. Others were forced to convert, while many families fled Spain. Maimonides was 10 years of age when his family was forced to flee. They settled in Fez, Morocco, where his brilliant father shaped him into a Talmudic scholar of repute. He also mastered what we call Chochmah, which is the universal wisdom of humankind. He knew the works of Aristotle and Plato and their Islamic interpreters and so on. Maimonides also became an expert in astronomy and medicine. In 1165, the family journeyed to the land of Israel, but unable to settle, they continued to the large Jewish community of Cairo, where Maimonides married and settled down. He then devoted a complete decade, approximately from 1168 to 1177, to producing his crowning literary achievement, the Mishnah Torah. He was an Ish Halacha. He was the greatest rabbi of the Middle Ages. He wrote the greatest law code in all of Jewish history, the Mishnah Torah. He was an absolutely outstanding master halachist. For the first time since God gave the Torah at Sinai, the entire body of Jewish law would be codified in a systemic, clear, and concise fashion. The 14-volume masterpiece created a powerful impression across the Jewish world. Then, in 1177, tragedy struck. Maimonides' brother, David, drowned when his ship, fully laden with merchandise, sunk in the Indian Ocean. The brothers had shared a deep bond, and Maimonides grieved terribly for years. David had also been Maimonides' business partner, and this calamity meant financial ruination for Maimonides, who was now forced to become a doctor. His expertise soon caught the attention of the Egyptian ruler, Sultan Saladin who appointed Maimonides to the position of royal physician. Maimonides also served as the leader of Egyptian Jewry. He juggled his time between his royal duties, treating private patients, serving as a statesman for the Jewish community, teaching Torah, and discussing medicine, philosophy, and science with his non-Jewish audiences. Maimonides described his schedule in a letter to a dear student. Rabbi Samuel Ibn Taban of Provence. I live in Fostad, and the Sultan lives in Cairo. I must see him every morning to check on his health. As a rule, I am in Cairo early each day, 
and even if nothing unusual happens, by the time I get back to Fostad, half the day is gone. When I come home, my foyer is always full of people, Jews and non-Jews, important people and not, judges and policemen. I apologize and ask that they should be kind enough to give me a few minutes to eat. That is the only meal I take in 24 hours. Patients go in and out until nightfall. And sometimes, I swear to you by the Torah, it is two hours into the night before they are all gone. I talk to them and prescribe for them, even while lying down on my back from exhaustion. On Shabbat, the whole congregation, or at least the majority of it, comes to my house after morning services, and I instruct the members of the community as to what they should do during the entire week. We learn together in a weak fashion until the afternoon. This is my schedule. His quill hardly saw any rest either. Jewish communities from distant lands sought his advice and rulings on Jewish law. And Maimonides felt compelled to pen yet another literary masterpiece to forestall a developing crisis in Jewish faith. Many Jewish scholars in the Arabic lands had been swept up in the newfound Islamic obsession with Greek philosophy. This left some Jewish scholars deeply disturbed by the apparent intellectual contradictions between contemporary Greco-Islamic philosophy and various precepts of the Torah. In 1191, Maimonides published a treatise that thoroughly addressed these issues from a philosophical standpoint under the title, Guide for the Perplexed. When Maimonides passed away in 1204, the entire Jewish world mourned his passing. An epitaph without historical parallel was carved into his gravestone, proclaiming that since the days of Moses, no Jewish leader's achievements had rivaled that of Moses Maimonides. So this gives you a little bit of a, uh, a, 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 of a quick background of Moshe ben Maimon. Maimonides wrote, as we all know, the Mishnah Torah, which we're going to talk about, the Guide to the Perplexed, which is, which is in front of you right over here, which is called the Meir Nevuchim. He actually wrote the Meir Nevuchim at a, 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 a young age, at the age, I believe, of 36. He wrote this book, which is called the Meir Nevuchim, which people still study until, uh, until today. All his books are studied. The Ramam wrote a commentary on the Mishnah, on the whole Mishnah. He wrote a whole commentary on it, and we all know it very well because in that commentary, commentary of the Mishnah, which is the oral law, he wrote the, the 13 principles of Jewish law. And um, again, not everybody agreed with him. He wrote, there's many letters of the Rambam, there's medical writings of the Rambam. I have a book in my house, which has the medical advice of the Rambam to uh, different ailments. So here was an unbelievable individual who wrote so much Torah and, and scholarly and medical advice. That's truly amazing that he accomplished all this while he had to uh, make work as a doctor to make a living. The Rambam wrote here, you see the commentary of the Mishnah. He wrote this commentary on the Mishnah, and uh, which is, which is an unbelievable, the Rambam goes through the whole makeup of the, how the Mishnah came into being. And he called this book ultimately Mishnah Taita. He called this book, the Mishnah, the teachings of the Taita, or the repetition of the Taita. But he, he called it after also the Mishnah that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi wrote. And this is a copy, and this is a picture of that book. It took my Maimonides 10 years to order the author Mishnah Torah. This took him the most time. This work was completed in the year 1180. The difference between the Rambam, the, the, the Mishnah Torah, and the other books of the Rambam wrote was that the Mishnah Torah was written in Hebrew. 
while all his other books were written in Arabic. And later it was translated from Arabic, later on it was translated from Arabic into, into Hebrew. But the Mishnah Torah, this he wrote specifically in Hebrew. Now you can imagine that Amma, when he authored these books, he wrote it. These, these were, there were no printing presses of those days. He wrote these books. Imamish wrote these books, wrote, written by hand. And they were written from his from, from him, they were written by scribes who copied his original text. I'm telling you this, you're gonna see something interesting in one of the manuscripts that they're gonna show you in a moment. So the Rama writes in Mishnah Torah, he says, the mitzvahs given to Moshe at Mount Sinai were all given together with their explanations. The Rama says, I'm not telling you anything new. Everything was given by Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah and its teachings. Moshe, our teacher, personally described, transcribed the entire Torah before he died. He did not, however, transcribe the explanations of the Torah. Instead, he commanded it verbally to be to the elders and to, Yush and to Joshua and to, to, to the totality of Israel. As it says, be careful to preserve everything that I prescribed to you. For this reason, it's called the oral law. So now I'm says the difference between the written law and the oral law. Moshe Rabbeinu gave the written law. He then transmitted it orally to the Jewish people that they would know exactly what they were, they needed to do. And that was given over, that was oral tradition. Later, that's where the Rambam comes in. And the Rambam says, I'm gonna write a book that since Moshe Rabbeinu has not been written. Since Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Torah, I am going to write a book on every mitzvah in the Torah, but la halacha with its reason. I'm going to write down the oral tradition, which was really given in the Mishnah and the Gemara, but it's very difficult to understand the law by the Mishnah and the Gemara. So here, is another small video that will explain what I just said in short. The five books of Moses, known as the written Torah, was accompanied by an oral tradition passed down from teacher to pupil for over a thousand years. During this time, these ideas were not formally committed to writing, and in fact, it was prohibited to do so. The intention was for students to learn directly from teachers and to accept personal responsibility for preserving the teachings for the next generation. Yet toward the end of the second century, the oral Torah was recorded in a book known as the Mishnah. Why did this happen? And who had the audacity to change the status quo? Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was head of the Sanhedrin. His piety, Torah scholarship, and wisdom earned him the name Rabbeinu HaKadosh, our holy teacher. It was he who made the momentous decision to record the oral law. The situation of the Jews was precarious. The might of the Roman Empire had spread its tentacles and ruled over the Jewish people in Israel. Around a hundred years previously, the Romans had destroyed the Second Temple. Countless Jews were killed, forced into exile, and sold into slavery. Similar atrocities occurred a few decades later, when the Romans crushed the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. At certain points, the study of Torah was forbidden on pain of death, religious practices were banned, and Torah sages were murdered. An oral method of transmission has advantages, but it can only flourish when people are living together in peace 
with a strong presence of scholars and teachers. However, under the circumstances of oppression and dispersion that existed at the time, an oral means of transmission was not advantageous as it jeopardized the accurate preservation of these treasured teachings. Considering these realities, Rabbi Yehuda made the bold decision to record the oral Torah. Indeed, over the next 2,000 years, the Jewish people often experienced great suffering, dispersions, and weakening of scholarship. Were it not for Rabbi Yehuda's revolutionary vision in writing down the Mishnah, many sacred teachings and practices would have been lost forever. Okay, so Rabbi Yehuda Anasi wrote the wrote the Mishnah. Then the Ravashi composed the Babylonian Talmud in Babylon, approximately 100 years after Rabbi Yechelen composed the Jerusalem Talmud. This was after the destruction of the Temple. Uh, uh, the Talmud actually was was completed like 400 years after the destruction of the Temple. The intent of both is to elucidate the words of the Mishnah, to explain its deeper points, and to relate the new teachings that were developed by each court in the era of Rabbi Huda until the completion of the Talmud. So the Ramam is telling you the way the Torah was given. The Torah was given by Moshe Rabbein, the Torah Shabbat Sav, the written law. It was then given orally to the next, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was in the times of the second base Hamid, so it was orally, totally, for over close to seven, eight hundred years, close to a thousand years. And then Rabbi Yehuda, in the second in time of the second temple, wrote the Mishnah, then happened the destruction, and then started Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, which is ultimately completed by, started by Ravashi, it was completed by Ravina, Ravina and Ravashi, which the Rambam brings down. Actually, the Rambam over here, I don't have it over here, but the Rambam shows you in his, in his, in his Mishnah Torah, he shows you the 40 generations from Moshe Rabbeinu until the completion of the Tanya, of the, of the Tanya, of the Gemara. He shows rabbi, student, rabbi, student, rabbi, student, rabbi, student, from Moshe Rabbeinu until the completion of the Gemara. So you see, there was not a breakage of, of Jewish law from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu until after the destruction of the temple, which is unbelievable. And that's why we stick to the Gemara. We really stick to the Talmud, because that is something that was always part of Am Yisrael. And it was, it was done in a way that there was never a breakage of history. Now the Ramam says, the Talmud style is quite complex and it's, it is composed in Aramaic with a mixture of other languages. This language was understood at a time of the people living in Babylon. In other places, however, even in Babylon itself today, this language is not comprehensible unless, it, unless one has studied it. It's Aramaic. You learn the Gemara, you know that the whole Gemara is in Aramaic. There are only a select few who comprehend the Jerusalem Babylonian Talmud and other work, works of the Medrash. They, re they require a breadth of knowledge, a spirit of wisdom, and much time in order to truly learn from them and many laws of, from them, the many laws of the Torah. Therefore, the Raman writes, with a deep trust in God, I read in my lines, my loins, I, Moshe, the son of Maimon, of Spain, I contemplated all these texts and sought to compose a work that would summarize their conclusion regarding all matters of the Torah in a clear and concise terms. In this way, the entire oral law could be organized for everyone without complication to those of lesser stature and to those of greater stature. So here the Rambam says, I'm putting together something. This was an ambitious work. It took him 
10 years, I'm going to put something together that is going to have the entire Torah. Every mitzvah in the Torah, whether it's a mitzvah that we do today or it's a mitzvah we don't do. Every law of the Torah, nobody else sat down and wrote a book of every mitzvah of the Even Shulchan Aruch, a very sick Cairo, who wrote a book on, code of Jew, on Jewish law, did not write. He only wrote the laws that were pertaining to that time and to, and to no, and the time of, 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 of uh, where there's no base Amidosh and there's no temple. And it doesn't give you the laws of the temple because it was a time of Gullus, it was time of exile. The Rambam writes the laws of the base Amidosh, writes the laws of the sacrificial offering. Writes the laws of the Kayin. The Rambam goes through. He gives you every single mitzvah. Nobody else has done such a work in history before his time and even after his time. So therefore, it's truly an unbelievable accomplishment that the Rambam did. And think about it. We're talking about the 1180. He finished this. Took him 10 years. So the Rambam did this all in writing, writing with his hand, writing. There was no printing presses. There was no printing presses. And he says, therefore, I've called this text Mishnah Teda, which means second Teda, he translated. For the person could study the written Teda and then this text and thereby comprehend the entire Teda without having study and had to study another text. So the Rambam tells you that if you would, if we would learn the Rambam, we would know every law in the Torah. Every law in the Torah, we would know. We would grasp every law in the Torah because he's covered every single law of the Torah. Now the Rambam, doesn't Chash Shalom take away anything from the Gemara? Because you still have to learn Gemara. Gemara gives you the fight behind the law and the reasoning behind the law. The Rambam doesn't do that. The Rambam is very concise in his Allah. He tells you the law and, and, and very short reason. He doesn't tell you the debate behind the law. In the Gemara, you have the whole debate behind the law. And therefore, if you really want to understand Jewish law, you need to learn Gemara. The Rambam actually writes in another place, he says a person needs to give away one third of his learning of a day to the learning of Gemara. Every Jew needs to learn Gemara because without Gemara, you don't got the understanding of the law and, and, and the debate and the, and, the, and, the, and the struggle of the law. And when you don't understand the struggle of the law, you lose the excitement of the law. You just, you, who, who is interested in does dry law? Do this and don't do that. But the Rambam, in essence, said, if you want to have a grasp in the entire Torah, you want to have a, you want to, in your hand, that's why actually one of the reasons is called the Yada Chazaka, the strong hand. You want the whole Torah in your hand. I'm giving every Jew the capability to grasp the entire Torah, every law of the Torah, in the grasp of his hand. And that nobody else did in history, besides Moshe Rabbeinu, who taught the Jews every law of the Torah, and he taught him taught them also the meanings behind the Torah. So here you have a a manuscript of uh, that's in the uh, in the uh, it's called the Huntington Manuscript. This is a man a written manuscript by a scribe by the name of Yosef ben Shlomo. And this is in the Oxford Museum in, in London. Is this manuscript was written in that time, in the, in the 1190s, 11, 11, uh, I think it's uh, 1180, written this manuscript. This is a manuscript, a written manuscript of, of, the, of the Rambam. Of the of the of the teaching, of it. I, I don't think it, you, you, you can even buy this. Later on, you have in, in the in 1296, I think this was. This is the Kaufman collection, 
and this is uh, this is uh, also a manuscript. Not a, it's more of a fancier, more uh, you know, uh, you know, nicer pages and nicer thing, but also something that was written by hand. What's amazing, going back to that previous manuscript, the Huntington manuscript, seemingly the guy who wrote this manuscript brought it to the Rambam. You can't read it in Hebrew in the bottom, all the way in the bottom, all the way in the bottom of this manuscript, it says, Huga Misifre, Misifri. This guy who wrote this manuscript brought, after he wrote it, he brought it back to the Rambam himself. And the Rambam writes in the bottom, he says, I was Magi, I, I, I checked it out from my own writings. And I accept it as a true Ani Maimon, Moshe ben Maimon, Masabi Zechatzad Lebracha. I, Moshe, the son of Maimon, Rabbi Maimon, a blessed memory. This is amazing, an amazing manuscript that you can see. So, this was something that the Ramam himself held in his hand and checked it out. And he, and he saw that the scribe, whoever wrote it, was 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 uh, was correct. He rewrote it correctly, and he didn't make a mistake. Because there's a big problem that the, when you have a scribe writing it, another scribe writes is a change of a letter, a change of a word can change the whole law. So it's unbelievable. This does a beautiful picture of this manuscript, and the uh, and the Rambam uh, giving his uh, stamp of approval of the rewriting of this halacha, the rewriting of this page in the Rambam. As you can see there. Ultimately, this, 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 this page of this, the Rambam, this real copy of the Rambam, fell into the hands of Eliezer, the son of Prachir, and he wrote a letter. It should be, in its entirely be placed in the keeping of the Beth in the court forever, that it should not be sold or redeemed, nor should be a single person ever take possession of it. It should rather be kept available so that all scholars can correct their own version against it, but not read from it regularly or copy from it. Rather, anyone wishing to correct his version should borrow the volume he needs from the Beth Din from the court, leaving a bond against the value with the Beth Din until he corrects his own book and returns it. Ultimately, I think it was found by this guy Huntington. That's why it's called the Huntington. Uh, it's called the Huntington Manuscripts, and it's in the uh, in Oxford University. So you can actually go see the original, one of the original writings of the Rambam manuscripts of the Rambam. It's truly, un, truly amazing. Ultimately, as you see in this picture, the, the, when the, in the in the fourteen hundreds. 1490, when uh, printing came into uh, existence, uh, um, the Rambam was, I think, I believe, again, you can Google it, I believe the Rambam was one of the first books to be printed in, in, in Hebrew. And this Mishnah Torah, I actually read this daily, it says, Mishnah Torah, Moses of my mind, it says, Sino, Gesher Sino in 1490. And you can actually buy this book. You can actually buy this uh, book for four, between fifty, hundred and fifty thousand and two hundred thousand dollars in Sotheby's. So I think you can, uh, if you have some money available, you can actually buy the buy this for two hundred thousand dollars if you have that capability. So here we have such a, a such an unbelievable history of of, of the Rambam. The Rambam ultimately it was printed many, many times. And today you can buy a set of Rambam in English in hundreds of in many different languages, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's available in any, for anybody to learn. The Rambam also authored an unbelievable, before he wrote the Mishnah Torah, he authored what he called Sefer HaMitzvahs. Sefer HaMitzvahs, the Rambam authored the concept of how all we know that is 613 mitzvahs, but the Rambam 
We don't know exactly what other 630. You open a Chumash, and you're going to just read the Chumash, you're not going to know what is a mitzvah and what is not a mitzvah. Are all things that are in the Chumash a mitzvah? Or just as a statement? Or is it a mitzvah only for that time? Maybe only for the Jews who went out of the desert. Some things that were said, not every generation is in a mitzvah forever. The Rambam wrote a, a, a before the Mishnah Torah, he wrote, he wrote a book called Sefer HaMitzvahs, which he codifies the 613 commandments. <clears throat> As it's brought down, Rabbi Salaam taught that 613 mitzvahs stated to Moshe Rabbeinu consists of 365 negative corresponding to the number of days of the years, and 248 positive, corresponding to the number of a person's limb. So there's 613 mitzvahs. 365 negative and 248 positive. What are the 600, and, what, what are these mitzvahs? Which one, does anybody know all the 613 mitzvahs? Rabbi Amnuna said, what is the verse, what is the verse that alludes to this? It's written, Moshe commanded to us the Torah, an inheritance to the congregation of Jacob. The word Torah is the numerical value of 611. Two commandments we heard directly from God at Sinai, and the remaining 611 were taught by Moshe Rabbeinu. So you have the word Torah equals up to 611. This is a Gemara, Talmud Makas. You have 611, Torah. Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe. Torah was given to us by Moshe, his 611 commandments. Ani Hashem Alekecha. I am God, your God. And you shouldn't have another God. That was given by, the, it was heard by God himself. As we all know that when the Jewish people, when God said, I am God, your God, they all died. And then he had to revive them. And then he said, you should have not have another God. And they all died. And the Torah says, the Jewish people said to Moshe Rabbeinu, please, you talk to God. Because we don't want to die. You talk to the Abish and tell us. And that's what we say. Torah, tziva, lanu, Moshe. Torah, that was given to us by Moshe. Because Moshe Rabbeinu gave us 611, I mean, gave us through the command of God, the 613 commandments, 611 commandments, totally 613 commandments. But if you think about it, you think about it. It says the children of Israel shall encamp each man by his division with a flagstaff of their father. We just read this in the Torah. Some distance from the tent meeting, they shall encamp. This is a command how the Jewish people travel through the desert. Is this a mitzvah? Even though it's a command, is this one of the 630 mitzvahs? Or speak to the entire congregation of children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy. Kedoshim to you. We're going to come up soon to that portion. The portion of Kedoshim. You shall be holy. What is that mitzvah? What is the meaning of that mitzvah? Is it a mitzvah? What is the mitzvah? These are all questions. He shall bring a guilt offering to God for his sin, which he has committed, a female animal from the flock, either a sheep or a goat. But if he can't, he shall bring two dirtle toes. It means a rich man has to bring up a sheep. A poor man has to bring, a poorer man has to bring a, a, a dove. But if he can't afford two turtles or a real poor man or two young doves, and he shall bring fine flour for a sin offering. So the Torah says, is this three mitzvahs or one mitzvah? How do we read this verse? Is the Torah, did the, did the Torah over here give three commands? The command to the rich man, the command to the semi-rich man, the command to the poor man? Or is it one mitzvah? One mitzvah or three. You shall take fine flour and bake it into 12 loaves and place them two stacks in each stack upon the pure table. This was a, this was a command to put the lechem upon him, the showbreads in the temple. One mitzvah 
was the one mitzvah, the baking, the placing them on the on the on this certain table, or was it three mitzvahs? From the verse, you cannot tell. Let's something. Let's come something to. That's we all do every year. You shall take for yourself. On the first day, the fruits of the fruit of Adar tree, a etrog, a date palm from a branch, a braided tree, a braided tree, and a willow of the brook. Those are the four things you have to use for a lul of an esrog. You need to have a myrtle and a willow tree and a, and a, and a palm tree and a and a, a citrus fruit. Is it four mitzvahs or is it one mitzvah? What are they? How do you, you it's very hard. So if, if even if we know there's 630 commandments in the Torah, it's very hard to know what are the 630 commandments in the Torah. When God says, we know there's a big argument between Maimonides and Nachmanides. He doesn't bring down this class, but I am God your God. Is that a mitzvah? I am God your God, the first commandment. That we call the first commandment. I am God, your God. Is that a mitzvah? The Ramban says that's a statement. It's not a mitzvah, it's a statement. I am God, your God is a statement. Either you take it or not, but it's a statement. The Rambam, my man, he says, no, it's a mitzvah. He counts it as one of the 613 positive, in, in, the, in the positive commandment. What is the mitzvah of I am God, your God? So is the, there's ways of calculating the mitzvahs. And there are others, Sefer Achinuch, who also do the, does the 613 mitzvahs. The Ramam also did a book called Sefer Mitzvahs, and he goes through all the mitzvahs in the Torah. He spells out each of the 248 positive and the 365 negative. And that was also an unbelievable accomplishment of the Rambam. And the Rambam did this because he went a step further than the Rambam. And I believe most, most, most think that he did this because when he wrote his book and he wrote the laws, Mishnah Torah, the book of laws, before every chapter, he says, when he talks about a mitzvah, he says, how many mitzvahs, positive mitzvahs, and how many negative mitzvahs are there? So if you look right over in front of you, this is one of the laws of the Ram, Sefer Mitzvahs. And right in front of you, he has Shvisa Sar, the laws of Yom Kippur. Shvisa also is the laws of Yom Kippur. And right before he starts, he says, Yesh Bechlal and Arba Mitzvahs. Yom Kippur has four mitzvahs. Shtei Mitzvahs Ase, two positive. Shtei Mitzvahs Leis Two negative. Is that proton? And I'm going to tell you which are the positive and which are the negative. Lishba is by Memelacha, not to work in Yom Kippur. Shalas is Memelacha. That's the two, that's the, that's the, uh, that's, no, I'm sorry. So Lishba is a positive, not to, uh, to, to just rest. That's a positive, to rest. You shouldn't work. That's a negative. The Sanis, to fast. It's a positive. Shalachal. Velishtais, but you shouldn't eat and drink. So you have two positive and four negative, and two negative. Ubir kala mitzvahs elu bepedek beprakamela. And to explain these four mitzvahs and to explain the law, we're starting chapter one of these laws. The Rambam does this on his entire book. It's the Rambam wrote 83 topics. In Mishnah Torah, 14 books, 83 chapters. The Rebbe once said, he spoke about the Rambam and the importance of learning the Rambam, he said, he said the word machla, machla, the word machla, which is sickness, it's, it's interesting that he mentioned that and we're going through a machla right now. He said the word machla, machla equals up to 83. Mem, ches lamed hei. He goes up to 83. And the Rambam gave you 
a way of getting out of a machla is to learn his 83 chapters of the Rambam in his 14 books. Very interesting. So to hear that the Rambam in essence gives you, he, he, he tells you before every chapter that he's going to explain the Jewish law, he gives you the, 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 the positive commandment and the negative commandment. He does this by every chapter. Truly fascinating, unbelievable, unbelievable account. So first he first he, he writes the book, and it's it's put in the it's usually put in before the other chazak. He writes all the mitzvahs, and then he splits it up. As you go through his book, he splits it up from 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 every uh, machla is a sickness. Machla is sickness in Hebrew. It's a it's a possible. So that I will take away a machla sickness. Machla is a sickness. So the Ramam machla is eighty three, and the Ramam eighty three, and the Rambam wrote eighty three different topics of the mission. So therefore, the Rebbe asked that you can that we should learn the Rambam three chapters daily. You complete it in one year. Or one chapter of Mishnah daily, you complete it in three years. Or at least Sefer mitzvahs, you should learn a couple of mitzvahs every day, which is divided already, and you'll complete the entire, all the mitzvahs of the Torah in, an, in, an, in, an, in one year. And think about it. I mean, if you could do three chapters a day, which is, which is not that easy, but today they have it in English, if you even do one chapter a day in three years, you got the whole Torah in your hand. And if you do even say for our mitzvahs, you'll have the whole, all the mitzvahs, and the Ramam tells you the mitzvah and the verse, you'll have all the mitzvahs of Torah at your fingertips. So the Rebbe says, this is a statement of the Rebbe. The Rebbe writes, we have spoken numerous times about need to unify all Jews. This unity is even more important, even important when considering that it brings us closer to redemption. One of the ways to achieve this unity is when all Jews unite through studying one area of Torah. While there are mystical explanations of how, of how doing, of for how doing so achieves unity, it's also quite practical. When many people study one subject, they can discuss and analyze the matter together. Even though they may differ in how they understand the subject, the discussion will nonetheless lead to an affection and friendship. And there's a special advantage in achieving this type of unity by studying Maimani's Mishnah a work of Jewish law that encompasses the entirety of the oral Torah in clear and concise language. Other works of Jewish law, such as the Shabbat do not include all the do not include all the mitzvahs, such as those that are applicable when the temple is standing, as I mentioned. Thus, by studying Mishnah Torah, one fulfills the mitzvah to study all the Jewish law in a complete manner. You, Gemara, it says, when you're going to come up to heaven, they're going to say, "Did you learn the whole Torah? Did you learn the whole Torah in your lifetime?" You say, is it possible? Can I learn the whole Shas? I mean, you have you have Dafa Yomi. It takes you seven years to do that, Dafa Day. Here you can and 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 it's again, you're not gonna get the you're not gonna get the entire uh we hard for you because it's so the learning Gemara is difficult. So here is a capability that's easy. You don't have to be a scholar, like to learn the Talmud, you have to be a person that's a scholar and be able to can to have a focus, this is this is much easier. For these reasons and other, I'm suggesting that in addition to the Torah topics that people regularly study according to their individual abilities, it would work for for everyone to re, to resolve without force or binding oath to study a daily portion of Mishnah Torah in a way that everyone studies the same topic each day and concludes the cycle on the same day. That would be an unbelievable thing to do. Today, we are going to make a siyam on the Rambam. And not only make a siyam on the Rambam, 
but we're also going to make aschala. We're going to start because actually today, in the in the in the three year cycle, in the one year cycle, we start again the Rambam. The importance of this is the Gemara says Abaye said, "May may I receive my reward because when I see a young scholar." Was completed a tractate, I make a celebrate a celebratory feast for the sages. So to make a seem a buyer a custom, a custom in the sources of universal custom that when a Jew finishes studying a tractate in Talmud, we praise God and publicize that this person merited to achieve by, by making a festival meal. Evidence of this custom is seen in the Talmud, Tainus. Where it states that there are two, there are no holidays of the joyous to the Jewish during the temple times as the holiday of Kippur and the 15th of Av. The Talmud comments the Yom Kippur is an understandable, very joyous day, was a day that the atonement. What is the 15th of Av such a special day? The Talmud provides a multiple answer until it settles an answer given by Rabba and Abyasi. They both say, the 15th of Av was a day of rejoicing because it's the last day that the wood chopper for the altar. They used to chop the wood, different families would chop the wood for the base for the altar in the in the temple. The last time this was in the summer, they eat the summer because they wanted the wood to be dry. This was the last time they chopped the wood. Since they completed a great mitzvah on that this day. Jews would rejoice and deem this day a festival. There was no greater happier day but a Jewish people like Yom Kippur and Hamisha Basbab. So here, when they finished something, when a Jew finishes something, it came into a great celebration. And this was wood choppers. This teaches us that the day in which we conclude the study of the Torah book is a festival, but there's no greater mitzvah than completing a book of Torah. This especially so, even if one intends to begin a new book of Torah shortly after, it doesn't make a difference. This joy is a mitzvah not only for one who concludes the book, but for all others as well. This is proven by the fact that Abai would make a celebration when someone else concluded a tractate. He would invite many sages to attend. Abaya made a great celebration. We're going to finish the Rambam today. It's a great celebration. After we finish it and we start the new one, you should make a celebration. Okay. In 1985, there was a shir, there was a Siam Rambam in Cairo. And I want to give you this beautiful video. You're going to listen to it. Let's see if I can get it. Yisrael Kotsever is a senior journalist who covered the Israel Defense Forces for several decades for numerous Israeli newspapers and media channels. Through the years, he consulted and received much advice and guidance from the Rebbe. This interview was filmed as part of the Faithful and Fortified series. Please help us record more testimonies like this one and get involved in the My Encounter with the Rebbe project at 1000encounters.com. הפכתי במידה מסוימת לשליח, להעברת מסרים, לקציני צבא בכירים, לאישי ממשל בכירים בישראל, אבל גם למדתי רבות והודרכתי בדרך כיצד לבטא דברים בתחומים שבהם עסקתי, תחום הביטחוני בעיקר, תחום האחר במדינת ישראל. כאשר ראיתי ברבי אדם שלא רק הוא משכמו ומעלה, לא רק שהוא אדם שבקי בכל המחמנים ואין לי בכלל בכלל מה להיכנס ולומר את הדברים האלה, אבל בתחום הספציפי שלי הייתה לרבי ראייה רחבת טווח גם ברוחב העירייה גם לעומק העניינים, וגם הרבה פעמים, כל הפעמים, קדימה ולטווח ארוך. 
לא פעם כשפגשתי קצינים בכירים, הם אמרו לי, האיש מדהים אותנו. אנחנו לא אנשים דתיים, אבל אנחנו באים אליו, ויש לנו את התחושה שיושב מולנו איש צבא שעבר כל שנותיו ביחידות, שמכיר את ה... מחשבת המלחמה, שמכיר כלי נשק, שמכיר מהלכים צבאיים, שמבין במודיעין, ורוחב היריעה שלו היה עצום בניתוח של הדברים, וזה גם מה שהביא אליו לא מעט קצינים בכירים. ביקרתי 11 פעם במצרים. הרבה מהפעמים האלה היו פגישות גם עם חוסני מוברק. וחוסני מוברק בדרך כלל היום כבר פחות, כי הוא לא כל כך בריא ולא כל כך עושה את זה, אבל בשנים הראשונות כשהיינו מגיעים עם ראש הממשלה, עם שר הביטחון, עם אחרים, הוא היה לוקח את העיתונאים לאיזה חדר צדדי, יושב איתם, הוא מפתח שיחה מאוד מעניינת, אישית, חופשית. אני זוכר את אחת מהפגישות האלה, היינו חמישה-שישה עיתונאים, והוא האיץ את השיחה. מאיזושהי סיבה הוא האיץ את השיחה. ולקראת סוף השיחה הוא קורא לי ואומר, אני רוצה שתיכנס אליי לחדר. ואני נכנס לחדר, הוא אומר לי, אני יודע מה אתה כותב, אני יודע מה דעתך, אני שומע אותך בפגישות. יש לי שאלה מיוחדת אליך. אתה יכול להסביר לי מה רוצה הרבי מלובביץ' ממני? נדהמתי. אמרתי לו, למה כבוד הנשיא מתכוון? הוא אומר, הוא מדבר נגד ההסכם איתנו, הוא רואה בנו איום שלא ייפסק גם לעתיד. למה, למה הוא עושה את זה? מה יש לו נגדי? הסברתי לו. את הגישה של הרבי. אמרתי לו, הרבי ישמח מאוד, אני משוכנע בכך שאם כבוד הנשיא יגיע לארצות הברית, אין לי שום ספק שהרבי ישמח גם להיפגש איתו, ולומר לו את הדברים האלה, אני יכול להסביר רק. וישבנו חצי שעה, והייתה שיחה מאוד מעניינת, מאוד מעניינת עם הנשיא מוברק, סביב הנושא של הרבי. מי הרבי? מה הגישתו? קצת היסטוריה על חב"ד? מה העמדה? הייתה לו גם את השאלה שכל שאר ישראלים רבים שאלו, אז למה הוא יושב בניו יורק? הבהרתי לו גם את זה. סיפרתי לו על פעילות חב"ד בעולם כולו. זה נכנס אליו, לדעתי, לראש. וזה, אני ראיתי את זה במקום אחד הרבה שנים אחרי זה. הרבה שנים אחרי זה. קרה כשהרבי אמר לעשות את הסיומים, הייתה תקופה כשהתחילו לעשות את הסיומים של לימוד, של הלימוד, של הרמב״ם, אז המארגנים של זה בארץ החליטו שהם הולכים לעשות סיום של הרמב״ם בבית כנסת הרמב״ם בקהיר, בית הכנסת שבימים אלה מושלמת. עבודת השחזור והשיקום שלו בצורה יפה מאוד, וחב"ד החליטו לעשות שם את הסיום של הרמב״ם בבית חב"ד, אבל היה חשש שבשל השם שיש לחב"ד, והדברים שהרבה אמר על מצרים שלא ייתנו להם. שאלו אותי, אתה יכול לדבר עם מישהו? אמרתי, תנו לי, אני אחזור אליכם. דיברתי אז עם השגריר המצרי בישראל, אמרתי לו, חסידי חב"ד רוצים לעשות. אז הוא אמר, מה הם ידברו שם? הפחד היה מה ידברו. אמרתי לו, הם רוצים לעשות סיום של הרמב״ם, זה לימוד, הרמב״ם היה חי במצרים. הוא אומר על הרמב״ם, אתה לא צריך לספר לי, אני יודע רבות על הרמב״ם, אני גר בקהיר. אני מכיר את, את הרחוב שבו נמצא הבית ליד השוק הכי מפורסם במצרים, חאן אל-חלילי. מה הם רוצים לעשות? אני אעביר את הבקשה. אמרתי לו, אני לא יודע למי אתה הולך לדבר. יש לי בקשה. אם זה יכול לעלות עד לדרג הבכיר ביותר אצלכם, לנשיא, 
תעלה את זה. לי אין ספק שהנשיא שלכם יאשר את זאת. הוא הבטיח. אני לא יודע עד היום אם הוא דיבר עם הנשיא או לא דיבר עם הנשיא. אחרי יומיים הוא חזר ואמר, דיברתי עם החלונות הבכירים ביותר, אין שום בעיה לחסידי חב"ד לבוא ולעשות את הסיום, והסיום מתקיים, וטיפלו יפה בחסידי חב"ד, וזה רק מראה שדברים ניטעו שם, שגם במצרים וגם במקומות אחרים, גם במקומות אחרים, המעמד של הרבה היה מעמד איתן, התחשבו בדעתו. הרוחב הגיע למצרים, הגיע לארצות ערביות אחרות, הגיע למקומות אחרים. הגיע למקומות אחרים. The first book is the Book of Knowledge, Laws of Basic Principles of Judaism. The second book is a book of, called Book Ava, Book of Love, Laws for Inspired, Love God, Mezuzahs, and about the laws of Mezuzahs, laws of davening. Third book is the Book of Times, Laws of Shabbos, Laws of Yontiv. The fourth book is the Book of Women, Laws of Marriage, Divorce. The fifth book is the Book of Holiness, Kedusha. Laws Forbidden Sexual Relations, Kosher Food. The sixth book is the Book of, of uh, Promises, the Laws of Oaths, the Laws of Vows. The, the seventh book is the Book of Seeds, which, uh, with, with uh, Zroim, which pertains to agriculture, laws of and, and Israel. The, book of, uh, the, the eighth book is the Book of Avoida, Service, laws pertaining to the Temple, public sacrifices. The ninth book is the Book of Sacrifices, laws of sacrificial, of the individual. The 10th book is the book of purity, laws of ritual purity and impurity. It's a very heavy book. The 11th book is the book of injuries, laws pertaining to, to uh, damages. The book of acquisition, laws pertaining to sale and purchase. The 13th book is the book of judges, laws for uh, civil matters and other sorts. And the last book, the 14th book is the book of judges, Laws regarding the courts and laws of the last law, the Torah. Soim Tos Malach Melech. You should have a king. And the ultimate, uh, the end of this 14th book is the, is the laws pertaining to Mashiach, who, which is only the Rambam wrote the laws about the coming of Mashiach. So the Rambam wrote it in the book of laws. It was not just uh, like the prophets who just wrote a prophecy. The Rambam writes exactly what Mashiach is going to do, who is Mashiach is going to be, etc. It's a fascinating part of the Rambam. It, we're going to end off the Rambam. Um, we're going to make the scene. This is the ending of the Rambam, which the Rambam talks about Mashiach. In the era of Mashiach, the Rambam writes, there'll be neither famine, no war, no envy, no rivalry. Because what good will flow in a good because good, what's good will flow in abundance. And all the delights will be freely available as dust. The occupation of the entire world will be solely to know God. Therefore, the Jews will be great sages and know the hidden matters, grasping the knowledge of their creator. according to the full extent of human potential. As it says, the world will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters covers over the ocean. This is a verse of Isaiah. And that's the way the Rambam ends his 14 books of Yad HaZaka. He ends with the prophecy that Mashiach is going to come And what Mashiach is going to bring, the most important thing that Mashiach is going to do is going to give the capability for the world to know God, the knowledge of God throughout the entire world. Yidin and non-Jews will all serve the Abishah, will all be, there will be no hatred, there will be no wars, there will be no, 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 no fighting, etc., etc. And we know that this is, this is the statement, that's the statement we have in the war 
on the United Nations, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into, into uh, pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against another nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's the same statement of the Rambam, the same place where the Rambam establishes the fact what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. And that's the way the Rambam ends of his book, that, uh, that we will have no hunger, war, jealousy, unhealthy rivalry, spiritual uh, in intensity. There's going to be a spiritual revolution. It's Gallus, a revelation of godliness in the world. It is appropriate to rejoice when completing the Teda, and it's customary to immediately begin from the very beginning of the Teda. This preve prevents the pre pre uh, I can't read. prosecuting angels from alle alleging that they are finished with the Teda and do not want to study it anymore. And therefore, we're going to start right away the beginning of the Rambam, which the, we all started in the, three, in the three chapters of the day. We started this first Mishnah today. This is the way the Rambam starts off the first book. Foundation of all foundation. And the pillar of wisdom is to know that there's a primary being who brings all of existence into being. All beings of the heavens and the earth, and that what's in between them came into existence only from the truth of this being. And that's the way the Nambam starts his book. The foundation of all foundation, this is the way it's written in Hebrew. Yesoid ha-yesoides v'amud ha the foundation of all foundations and the pillar of wisdom. And there are those who say that Amam starts off his book this way because in these four words, you have the name of God. Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. The name of God is written right in the beginning of his book. What's also beautiful that Amam, the Rebbe brings this down, that the Amam says, you should, the, the pillar of wisdom is to know that there's a primary being who brings all existence. Brings, it's like in the present state. The Rambam, in essence, says that the Avishta is bringing into existence every moment. We know this, this famous statement of the Baal Shem Tev, that the Baal Shem Tev said the same thing, that the Avishta, God, creates the world continuously. And that's why the Rambam uses, the, those that say that's why the Rambam uses this word, brings. What also is fascinating in the Rambam is that he writes to know. It's a very interesting word that he uses over here. He doesn't write to believe. The foundation of all foundation, the pillar of wisdom is to know. And the, and the Rambam writes this later, that that is the first commandment. I am God, your God. The commandment is to know that God is your God. The Rambam over here demands a person in his first law that we seek to comprehend, not only to believe, but to comprehend. What is interesting is in his, in his book of Sefer HaMitzvahs, he writes it differently. He writes the first mystery we are commanded is about is the belief in God. And that to believe that he's the original cause and the source of existence who brings all creations into being. So the Ramam cha changes it seemingly. Over here he writes in the book of, of, of in, in his Sefer HaMitzvah, in his book of mitzvahs he writes to believe. In his book of law he writes to know. There are those that say, first of all, the, in, in the book of, of uh, he wrote that in, 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 uh, in the, the, this was written in Hebrew, and the book of uh, Mitzvahs was written in Arabic. So maybe there are those who say that actually in Arabic, belief and no could be the same word. So maybe it was mistranslated. That's one way of looking at it. 
So, because why would the Ramam change? But the Rebbe says both are true because we have to have both things. A Yid is obligated. Maybe the Rambam wrote two different ways because a Jew is obligated in both. A Jew is obligated to, invest, to investigate to the best they can in order to understand about God as much as possible. And that's what the Rambam writes, as much as capable for your mind to comprehend. Because we're discussing an infinite, un unknowable God. There will always be something about him and he will, oh, in his ways that remain mysterious to us which is why faith will always be crucial part of this mitzvah. So that's why the Rebbe writes that the Rama meant both. The Rama meant that in the mitzvah of I am God, your God, and in the bits, and in his first obligation, his first mitzvah, his first law is that a Jew should try to have a knowledge of God to the best of his capability. And when he doesn't have the knowledge, then he has to go to his second concept, which is belief. And if you learn see this, you'll understand that the more you have knowledge, the bigger and the greater belief you will have. And a deeper belief. So the more knowledge you have, as the, even King, King Solomon said, Achakma, the most smartest man, said, Achakma, I am wise, but I realize, I realize that wisdom is really far from me. So how wise a person can be, we still have to have the concept of belief because the Abish, the God, is ain't safe, is infinite, and therefore we are finite and God is infinite. So the knowledge is very finite to God's infinite, the concept of God, which is infinite, and therefore we need both. Friends, we started, the, we, we finished the Nambam today. We started the Nambam. I hope I watered your, 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 your appetite into learn the Nambam. Either get a Rambam or get an app of the Rambam or go online, whatever it takes. There's so many ways you can today learn Rambam. The Rebbe asked, we can either learn two chap three chapters a day, one chapter a day, or even Sefer HaMitzvah. Start doing the book of the Mitzvah. We started today. Or maybe we started Sefer HaMitzvah two days ago, because... So we started just now with Sefer Mitzvahs, the book of the Mitzvahs. Do that at least. Start with that. And then ultimately go to the Rambam. Learn the Rambam. Try to, try to acquire the knowledge of the whole Torah in your hand and have it in your hand. The Rambam gave you that capability to have the entire Torah in your hand. I see two people asked a question. And, uh, oh, good stuff. Okay. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah. I hope you uh, all enjoyed. If anybody wants to ask something, they can ask. Um, and I hope that you will all learn Rambam from time, uh, every day at least. And uh, you will uh, all become more knowledgeable in the, in the learning of Teda and, and in the understanding of Teda. I wish you all a good day.